What's up folks? I'm starting a new video series. This one is going to cover some basic anatomy, physiology, and biomechanics. Now this is not going to be like super high level information. This is the kind of thing that you learn in an undergraduate class in college. But a lot of people never get the chance to learn this info. And a lot of the people who do learn it never apply it. So we're going to work on that application too. Alright, so what we're going to cover is several different factors that influence how much muscle tension is generated during the movement. Now, by understanding these things, it'll help you better understand the demands of different exercises. By understanding the demands better, you can select exercises better. You can also uh, select the correct technique for different exercises. All right, now the first thing we have to cover is just effort level. Now this is really simple, I'm not going to spend a whole video on it. Obviously if you put more effort into a movement, you're going to generate more muscle tension. Okay, so as we go and we look at the influence of these other factors, you need to consider that influence within the context of maximum effort. Okay, first thing we're going to talk about is muscle length and its influence on muscle tension. Now the general idea is as muscles lengthen, they become capable of generating more tension. But it's a little more complicated than that, so we're going to back up and look at some anatomy. We need to talk about the sarcomere. The sarcomere is the contractile unit of muscle. It's where your muscle tension is generated. Now one sarcomere is only a couple millionths of a meter long. So in a muscle fiber, what you have is a string of thousands of sarcomeres. Now as the sarcomeres shorten, the muscle fiber shortens. As the sarcomeres lengthen, the muscle fiber lengthens. So here is my beautifully rendered model of a sarcomere. So what we have are two ends of the sarcomere, and then we have between thick protein filaments and thin protein filaments. Now what happens when you contract a muscle is there is a series of chemical events that causes the thick protein filament to bind to the thin one and pull it. So that pulls the two ends of the sarcomere closer and when that happens in thousands of sarcomeres in a series the muscle shortens. Now the thing to understand is the amount of overlap between these filaments influences how much tension is generated. There is an ideal amount of overlap that allows the most binding between the two filaments. Now if there's more or less overlap, you get less muscle tension. So if the two ends are farther apart, you don't have very much overlap and you get less muscle tension. Also if the two ends are closer together, you have too much overlap and you get less muscle tension. Then the other thing we need to talk about is Titan protein. Titan protein runs from one end to the other. It's actually what your thick filaments are anchored on, so they're not just floating. Now Titan does not contract, it does not play a role in the active tension, but if these two ends get far enough apart, the Titan starts to stretch and that creates what's called passive tension. So again, the thick filaments pull on the thin filaments. That is your voluntary or your active tension. When the Titan gets stretched out, that's when you get passive or involuntary tension. So altogether, the anatomy of a muscle creates a length tension curve. Here's what it looks like. So you see there are actually three curves to look at here. You have your active tension. That's what you generate when you are trying to contract your muscles. You are voluntarily trying to move. Then the passive tension is what you feel when you stretch. So you're not trying to generate that tension, it's involuntary. It happens because the tighten and the connective tissue surrounding your muscle fibers is lengthening and that creates tension. So your active muscle tension is a product of your sarcomeres contracting. And that's this parabola right here. That's a product of that overlap we talked about. Over here, we can't get very much tension because there's too much overlap. Up here, we have the ideal amount of overlap, and over here we don't have enough. 
then your passive tension only kicks in after the muscle is lengthened. And you see it curves up really quickly as those tissues get longer. Now this passive tension curve is somewhat dependent on flexibility. If you're tighter, it's going to be shifted further to the left. And that's going to mean your total tension goes up quicker. If you're more flexible, this curve would be shifted more to the right. And that's going to mean your total tension is going to go up slower. In fact, you may even have a dip right here in tension before it goes up. Okay, now, millions of people have seen the length tension curve. And they'll memorize it for a test. But they never apply it to movement. So it just becomes some worthless information that they learned once upon a time. Don't let that happen to you. You gotta apply it. You gotta apply it! First thing you need in order to apply this information is a frame of reference. You need to be able to associate a body position with a muscle length on the curve. So pick any muscle. If you tighten it, flex it as short as it can go, that puts you on the left side of the curve where the muscle cannot generate very much tension because it's too short. If you stretch a muscle, that puts you over on the right side of the curve where you've lost active tension but you're gaining passive tension. Then the peak active tension is going to occur somewhere right around where you first start to stretch a muscle. So for example on the biceps, shorten as much as I can here Okay, not a lot of tension. Stretching is all the way back here. A lot of passive tension, not a lot of active tension back there. And then my peak active tension is going to be probably somewhere right around this position. Here's an immediate application of this information. This is why people do incline bicep curls. When their arm hangs back here, their bicep is lengthened more across the shoulder joint. That allows them to get more tension, allows them to lift more weight. So over here, we have the muscle in a shortened position. It can't generate very much tension. Now that might be where the triceps are with the elbow extended, or about where the quads are with the knee extended, or where the glutes are when you're in some hyperextension. Then, as we lengthen the muscles, Let's say we're at the bottom of a bench press. Your pectoralis and your triceps muscles are going to be somewhere out in this range, maybe out here. Uh, the bottom of a squat, your glutes and your quads, probably going to be out here in this range. Okay, so we're pretty close to our peak active tension. Then if you're stretching, you're going to have your muscle lengthened all the way out here. And you're going to be on this passive tension curve. Now most people probably don't get up into this extreme tension during stretching. They're probably more like around here. And you'll notice that at this point you still have a fair amount of active tension if you choose to generate it. And that's why PNF stretching is so painful. Because if you stretch your muscle and then contract it, you're going to add the active tension to your passive tension and that's going to put you up here. And that's a lot of tension. That's why it hurts so much. All right, now, I don't want you to get caught up in trying to identify the ideal length to work a muscle at. I mean, you wouldn't even know when your muscle was at that precise length anyway, so it's really not worth getting into. What I want people to understand is just that as you lengthen muscles, they are capable of generating more tension. Now, very basic application of that. The length tension curve is why we use range of motion in our strength training. Because it lengthens muscles. You do a full squat instead of a half squat because it lengthens your quads and your glutes. It allows them to generate more tension. You do push-ups all the way down to the floor because it lengthens your pecs and your triceps. It allows them to generate more tension. Now, for further application, what I'm gonna do is talk about the glute muscles and how much tension they generate during different movements. So as we cover the different factors that influence muscle tension, we'll be able to select the movements that involve the most glute tension. So today we talked about muscle length and effort. We need to lengthen the glutes for them to generate a lot of tension. The glutes are lengthened during hip flexion. So hip flexion, along with full effort, 
shows up in any pulls from the floor. Deadlift, snatch, clean. It shows up in sprint acceleration. It shows up in your deeper counter movement vertical jumps. It shows up in squats, lunges, or any other exercises that use those positions. So considering muscle length only, all those movements are candidates for involving the most tension in the glutes. So I'm going to do some application of the information in the videos. But you should not limit yourself to my videos. Start thinking about different exercises. Start watching people work out. Look at a movement and consider the effort level and the muscle length and these other factors we're going to talk about. Ask yourself, why does this movement make me sore? Why is this movement hard? Why is this movement easy? Ask the question, analyze the movement, apply the information. That's how you learn. That's how you get smart. All right, stay tuned for part two.